So good morning, everyone. Today's uh, journal club is on congenital vertical talus, and uh, we have Dr. Ashish Ranade, uh, a well-known pediatric orthopedic surgeon from Pune, and he had key interest in dealing with this problem in uh, in our fellows' curriculum. Later on, he is going to talk about vertical talus. Maybe it would come in the month of December or so. So we have chosen five papers. Uh, the first one is from Shalin, which is more of uh, Sharet's basic paper on pathoanatomy of vertical talus. So Shalin, you can start. And then we have four papers based on management. And we will discuss uh, the qualities of paper. Yeah, Shalin, please go ahead. So this is the first paper for today. It's a paper published in 1871. It's a pathological anatomy of- Alan, can you be a little louder? Yes, sir. It's the pathological anatomy of convex space valgus, uh, which was written by Bren Dr. Brennan and uh, Shara. So uh, the aim with which this paper was written was to detail the anatomy in myelomeningocele in children with congenital pes valgus and to uh, assess the neuromuscular imbalance between the inverters and the everters. So they, they had one case, who, uh, a newborn child with 3.6 kg birth weight who had a marred hydrocephalus and a thoracolumbar myelomeningocele. The right side foot had a convex pes valgus and left had an equinovarus deformity of the feet. All muscles except tibialis posterior responded to ferritic stimulation and uh, surgery for some cardiac abnormalities was done at 11 hours after birth and the child died due to respiratory distress. So they uh, performed a dissection of the uh, past plane of this foot, the right foot, and the norm and another normal foot of other child was a uh, similar dissection at the same time was carried out. And the difference in anatomy between these two children was studied. So the difference in subcutaneous tissue, the muscles, the bones, and the anatomic orientation was studied. They found that the subcutaneous fat was shifted laterally in children with pes planar valgus and uh, the medial longitudinal arch remained bare. So for the tendon anatomy, they found that the extensor retinaculum in a normal child is uh, present and functioning at two levels, while in pes valgus feet, the distal part of the extensor retinaculum, which covers the talus, is uh, quite shriveled and uh, non-functioning. The Peroneal tendon in normal children uh, passes behind the lateral malleolus. However, in children with best valgus, they found that bow stringing of the peroneal tendon occurred. And uh, the triceps insertion is in these children is broad and uh, covering the entire calcaneum. These were the three differences of the tendon which were seen from the lateral aspect. From the dorsal aspect, the because of the everters and the uh, laterally translated foot, they found that the tibialis anterior is quite uh, actioning in a straight line rather than going medially and insert, uh, inserting on the cun medial cuneiform, which occurs normally. The EHL also, the pull occurs in a straight line and, and the extensor digitorum longus they take a, the attendants take an acute turn after passing under the dorsal or extensor retinaculum and then get inserted over the metatarsals. Uh, so this was the difference in anatomy which was found compar in comparison to the normal feet from the dorsal aspect. From the plantar aspect, they found that the peroneus longus takes an acute turn of about 90 degrees which uh, which in normal feet is uh, relatively obliquely oriented. So these were the three uh, these were the important tendon and uh, muscle orientation changes they found in these children. From the bony aspect, they found that the talus, head, and neck were hypoplastic, and the sustenaculum telli was blunted, and there was no formation of anterior telocalcaneal joint. 
similarly for the calcanium they found that the calcanium was laterally displaced and everted plantar flexed and the posterior talocalcaneal joint was laterally tilted so the main bony changes were seen in the talus and the calcaneum and also the talocalcaneal joint and uh, they also uh, measured the muscle tendon ratio and they found that the extensor digitorum longus was hypertrophied and there was moderate atrophy of the tibialis posterior and they also performed histological examination of these muscles and found which confirmed these and showed the atrophy of tibialis posterior so and the ligaments medial longitudinal arch and long plantar ligament were found attenuated the medial side and the plantar ligaments were attenuated they uh, as a result of these altered anatomy of the muscles and action of them at the foot changes so the there is overt plantar flexion of the hind foot as a result of the tendon oculis or the uh, triceps sore the tibialis posterior because of atrophy and uh, decreased uh, uh, decreased muscle stimulation it is weak which which leads to overpowering of this is uh, what they concluded and they hypothesized from the available uh, data of the musculature and the anatomy with them that the uh, hind foot remains plantar flexed and because the inverter are weak the inverters overpower which leads to a lateral translation and dorsiflexion of the forefoot uh, the tibialis posterior does not act and peroni and the extensor digitorum longus overact and even act as inverters as well as dorsiflexors of the forefoot and as a result of these the tibialis plenovalgus develops also uh, as was evident in the anatomy that the talocalcaneal joint is unformed and the unsupported talocalcaneal joint by the uh, by the lower calcaneum as well as unsupported talus by the tibialis posterior leads to gradual vertical orientation of the talus so based on these anatomy they uh, hypothesize these were the muscular and the bony changes which lead to development of congenital vertical talus and they quoted various studies which have been carried out over the years before their study uh, which says that neuromuscular abnormality is the primary cause of development of congenital vertical talus which had been seen in quite a few number of cases and studies before them so they concluded that weak tibialis posterior is the forefront cause of foot deformity in myelomeningocele and may be applicable to other forms of spinal dysphysism also which lead to tibialis posterior weakness and to exclude primary abnormalities of the central nervous system is uh, important when we have a look at these cases before accepting convex spes valgus as an isolated primary deformity thing this however this study does not address the idiopathic etiology of deformity and uh, calcaneo cuboid joint altered anatomy which has been studied after this study by polman et al thank you uh so thank you shalin for this nice uh, presentation and this shows the importance of uh, release of tight structures lateral structures especially peroneus longus you know which is very tight now um first ashish uh, what do you think about this paper and this was paper from 1971 would you say that over period of this last 30 years this uh, our understanding of cvt has changed a little bit or this is stands a very uh, nice paper so far yeah so thank you molin it's honor to be part of this journal club uh, this is a very nice study but i think over the years the understanding has changed and over the years it was seen as more of the dorsal irreducible dislocation of the talonavicular joint which is secondary to muscle imbalance so i think that part evolved later and later on it was thought that it the deformity revolves more around that dorsal talonavicular dislocation 
but it's a very nice descriptive anatomy of what structures are contracted and it is very interesting to know back then they realized that even though it's a, a convex space plano valgus it's the equinus is at the ankle joint right now there are some important uh, and basic questions uh, which is which are raised by gaurav the first and foremost is why one foot goes into plano valgoid and the other in equino cavo varus so that this depends on the level of uh, myelomeningocele uh, gaurav like uh, we know that the peroneal muscles are supplied by l4 5 s1 and 2 while the tibialis posterior is from the posterior tibial now that's again a part of sciatic nerve but there are some differential affection higher you go more you see the this pleno valgoid uh, so i feel that the what happens whether it's a pleno valgoid or it's a equino cavo it depends on where the myelomeningocele is there what what level spina bifida is and basically there is a muscle imbalance which leads to this deformity the second question is what is the cause of cvt in idiopathic cases so i what i know is it's a uh, mal position within uterus which stays there for long and then it leads to secondary muscular uh, contractures so once we deal with this idiopathic ones the rate of relapse uh, is relatively less but muscle imbalance persists in neuromuscular so those patients would need a longer term brace wear and uh, there are higher rates of uh, recurrences also so that we'll see in the uh, papers subsequent papers where it has been discussed already so ashish do, would you like to comment on uh, Gaurav's question: Why some patients go into plano valgoid and why some in equino cavo varus? So, Gaurav, that's a very good question, and still this deformity is bit enigmatic. As per the known understanding, almost fifty percent of cases they are associated with some form of neuromuscular disorder or arthrogryposis, and fifty percent nothing is found. But still, we don't know the cause for. imbalance i mean per se there is no muscle attached to talus right there is no tendon which is inserted to talus but why it goes into plantar flexion and why navicular dislocates we we still don't know answer to that yet so i have had a child where uh, on one side it was cvt on other side it was club foot and the child has undergone all possible investigations including mri emg genetics but nothing was found so we don't know yet <laughs> so typically you know we see this uh, equino cavo varus now from understanding of uh, vince mosca and uh, neuromuscular we know that the peroneus longus is overactive compared to t band while uh, <laughs> in this uh, plano valgoids the t band is overactive and peroneus longus has relative less uh, power so t band pulls this navicular dorsally and as shalin mentioned sometimes it is inserted more on uh, anterior than the medial side and that is probably dorsiflex in the navicular instead of keeping it in front of uh, this so this has to do something with the level of uh, spina bifida right so any any other comment or question just one comment i mean yeah. just historic perspective since we are on this drainan dr drainan has excellent book on pediatric foot disorders two editions are available and those of you interested more into it drainans it's called the drainans the child's foot it's a very nice book Oh, yeah one may want to look through that not get it on telegram uh yeah it's there it's there on telegram yeah. right so let's let's move on to the other paper and uh, who is uh, 
Chinmay, it's your, your turn. Sir, Gaurav, sir, it's turn at. Sir, Gaurav, please. So all the fellows, you please don't hesitate to uh, ask questions. This is your platform. And uh, any silliest query, you can inquire here, OK? I hope I'm audible and visible to all. Screen is visible. Yes. So uh, my uh, the, uh, the title of my paper is Comparison of Posterior Approach versus Dorsal Approach in the Treatment of Congenital Vertical Talus. This paper was published in JPO 2001, and it was from Connecticut Children's Medical Center, US. The corresponding author was Jeffrey Thompson, and other authors were Augustus Mazoka, Peter DeLuca, and Mark Romnes. So we all know that congenital vertical talus is, is characterized by irreducible, rigid, telonavicular dislocation. Its incidence is one-tenth that of club foot and its exact etiology is still unknown. Ogata and Schwenker proposed a classification system that divides these patients into three groups, idiopathic CVTs, CVT associated with genetic or syndromic conditions, and CVT associated with neuromuscular condition. In most of the times, CAST treatment is ineffective and deformity results in significant pain and loss if untreated. So, Multiple surgical approaches have been described. Common ones include staged multiple incision technique, single stage medial incision technique, medial and posterior incision technique, and single stage dorsal approach. The purpose of this paper was to evaluate the results of authors' experience with single stage dorsal approach and to compare these results with patients treated with single stage multiple incision technique. It's a level four retrospective comparative case series. Materials included all CVT patients which were treated surgically at Newington Children Hospital from 1960 to 96 and at Connecticut Children's Medical Center from 96 to 97. Inclusion criteria included all patients of CVT which were treated surgically who were having three years of minimum follow-up and where pre and post treatment radiographs were available. So there were 24 kids. So they also described the, uh, the, the single stage dorsal incision approach where a single transverse incision is made at the level of ankle from the lateral aspect of telonavicular joint to the tip of the fibula. The anterior neurovascular bundle and the tendons are retracted, which allows complete exposure, complete dorsal, medial and lateral exposure of the telonavicular joint. The contracted anterior tendons can be lengthened or tenotomized. They also release the, uh, the calcaneo cuboid capsule medially, dorsally, and laterally. After the thorough release of the capsule, a smooth elevator was used to lift the talus head and to obtain the reduction. However, no attempt was made to reef the or reef or tighten the plantar telonavicular joint capsule or to advance the posterior tibialis. For neuromuscular or meningomyelocele associated CVTs, the tibialis anterior was placed through the drill hole in the talus with a bunnel suture and was tied over a button. In cases where limited dorsiflexion was there, they did a percutaneous hoax tenotomy. After obtaining telonavicular reduction, they passed a retrograde K-wire across the joint and they casted the foot in slight plantar flexion. The cast was changed after two weeks and the ankle was brought into more plantar flexion and was recast. Uh, yeah. The cast was continued for three months approximately and the pin was removed at eight weeks. After three months, they gave an orthosis to the child for another nine months. So there were 24 patients which were divided into two groups, group one and group two. These groups were further divided into three categories, idiopathic myelomeningocele and syndromic associated CVTs. In results, they, the length of follow-up was significantly different in both the groups. Group two, where dorsal approach was used, had only three years of follow-up, whereas group one had 9.6 years of follow-up. 
नंबर ऑफ सर्जरीज इन ग्रुप वर वर फोर्टी फाइव ग्रुप वन वर फोर्टी फाइव एज कम्पेयर टू एट इन ग्रुप टू इन ग्रुप टू फॉर एट फीट देवर एट सर्जरीज एंड सो देवर नो रिकरेंसेज क्लिनिकल स्कोर वॉज सिग्निफिकेंटली बेटर इन ग्रुप टू दी टूर्नी के टाइम एंड दी सर्जरी टाइम वॉज लेसर इन ग्रुप टू एंड देर वॉज नो केस ऑफ ए वास्कुलर नेक्रोसिस और रिकरेंस इन ग्रुप टू दे ऑल्सो मेजर्ड दी एंगल्स ऑन ए पी एंड लैटरल व्यू ऑन लैटरल व्यू दे मेजर टेलो कैलकेनियल टिबियो कैलकेनियल टेलर एक्सेस एंड बेस ऑफ फर्स्ट मेडिटार्सल एंगल ऑन ए पी व्यू दे मेजर्ड टेलर फर्स्ट मेडिटार्सल एंगल एंड टेलो कैलकेनियल एंगल there was significant improvement in all these angles in both these groups suggesting that both these techniques were equally effective in correcting the dislocation in discussion they compared this with previous studies uh, fiton and nevelos used these transverse dorsi, dorsal incision in seven patients and they concluded that scar was not adherent and healed well and there was direct visualization of the dislocated telonavicular joint Simon reported on seven patients with ten feet using this approach. Striker and Rosen also performed this approach, and they in twenty feet and they reported seventeen good and three fair outcomes. There was no case of AVN or recurrence. They also uh, compared the multi incision approach by Ellis and Shear's paper, which used a standard two stage posteromedial release and reported six cases of AVN out of sixteen. walker however didn't reported any case of uh, avian but one case of recurrence duncan and fixen used a one stage posterior release of 10 feet and had no taylor avian or recurrence whereas codros and dias used a cincinnati approach to correct 55 feet and he reported no taylor avian but 10 cases of recurrence the limitations of this study is that it's a retrospective analysis and there were multiple surgeons involved six surgeons were involved in performing surgeries in group 1 and 2 in group 2 so there can be a, a skill bias number of subjects in each group were very small and they were further divided into categories so there were a lot of factors and the follow up in group 2 was very very less as compared to group 1 to conclude dorsal single stage approach efficiently exposes the major pathology that is the tn dislocation both approaches are equally effective in successfully reducing the tn joint it also implies that reefing the plantar telonavicular joint and advancing the tibialis posterior is not necessary and a percutaneous heel cord lengthening is sufficient to correct the hind foot deformity Finally the dorsal approach involves less operative time less dissection similar radiographic improvement with improved and consistent clinical scores in my practice i will prefer this technique as compared to other techniques thank you this is open for discussion now so goro when they did the single posterior incision like uh, how do they uh, approach the calcaneo cuboid capsule so they uh, they have just mentioned this paper uh, in the discussion that that there is this technique where where this was used in, as only single posterior release was done there is not no further details about how it was done i'll i'll pull out this paper and see what exactly so earlier on you know with the, the people used to do with the cincinnati approach the cvt correction also Right. but it was difficult to reach right up to the calcaneo cuboid joint that's one and secondly the you might release the the telonavicular joint from the medial side and you can approach dorsally with other dorsal structures like uh, edl ehl uh, t band uh, in more severe and neurologic causes we need to release them so that that's uh, the isolated posterior approach has a very high recurrence and sometimes you know you may not be able to reduce it unless you release the calcaneo cuboid thing the main concern is uh, as the age advances and the deformities are very uh, rigid especially in the neuromuscular 
once you do dorsal release you know and when you correct the deformity the dorsal skin opens up so it is it's important that how many patients develop hypertrophic scar or they require uh, scar revision or you know that's what we have been observed we have observed in uh, very severe uh, club feet when we did posteromedial release there was opening and uh, hypertrophying of scar so that is what we need to know dr sudhir kumar uh, has raised question what is uh, what about the age of surgery so the, Gaurav, uh, yes sir do they yes, mention sir. yes sir the average age in group was one was 18 months and in group 2 it was 26.5 months so currently sudhir uh, the practice is till the age of 6 months or a year you try you can try close the reduction with this reverse ponsetti and after one year or if that is neglected patient has not turned up in time one year is a good age for the surgical correction what is the position of foot in cast at the end of surgical correction now again gaurav yes sir if you mentioned that they apply cast in equinus yes sir why 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 equinus because tight ta is also a factor which uh, keeps this uh, you know in, in puts in plano valgoid yes, so sir. my practice has been to put the foot in neutral or 5 degree dorsiflexion not in equinus what is the rational behind put it in equinus sir so that so the, their rational was to avoid the uh-huh, skin to avoid redislocation of the tn joint so they they casted in plantar flexion and then after that they they have not mentioned about whether they started physiotherapy or not but then uh, this and, be the rational and the the older group were fixed with a transfixing k wire yes sir uh-huh. both the groups both the groups both the groups okay yes ashish what is yeah. your practice uh, so dorsal incision i don't use i agree with all the points it's very difficult to reach the peroneals you have to go all the way in the back to reach the peroneals if you are using dorsal approach so i don't use it like um, i also use the medial and percutaneous and i agree i was going to ask that why they are giving the cast in subsequent plantar flexions when they have done percutaneous yeah, really, not yeah. so you know like uh, we will discuss later on but one more approach which is probably not discussed here which i learned from dr ashok johari there is triple approach so what dr johari does is a posterior uh, approach and if it is a, uh, so first is a medial approach you approach the medial side you release tip post and open the talonavicular capsule and then plike it that's one then he goes laterally to lengthen the capsule calcaneo cubital capsule lengthen the peroni and then at the end posterior if it's not very severe or a uh, idiopathic ones you do tenotomy that's fine in some neurologic ones which are lying which are very long standing then you do open and do capsulotomy also so this through this three approach there is no issue of any skin scarring you know because all these three incisions uh, can be well sutured some of these patients they develop significant edema post operatively uh, and it remains there for one week or so but uh, uh, gradually this edema goes down so so i am going to inquire with hitesh hitesh's paper is on this so i w- would like to inquire with him that what has happened to their although they are not mentioned so any other question or we can uh, yeah okay so thank you gaurav it was a nice uh, paper and nice review this is a long you know 30 years four surgeons so there will be a lot of fallacies but they have tried to put it uh, that the the recent approach is kind of better than the previous approach yes let's move on to the next paper uh, whose paper is this now is it shinam yes sir yes sir 
प्लीज शीन एम शेयर योर पेपर सो गौरव सी मोर यंगर फेलोज कम प्रेजेंटेशन गोज मोर कलरफुल Yes, sir. They are more tech savvy. Oh. नहीं नहीं ये ये स्लाइड्स हो में हाँ from beginning कर. Uh. Yes. Yes, we can Everyone, see you. Everyone. Um. Yes. Um. Uh, so I will. Um. Uh, I am going to present a paper on early results of a new method. on of treatment for idiopathic congenital vertical pelvis it was published in jbjs in 2006 the purpose of this study was to evaluate the results of treatment of idiopathic congenital vertical pelvis with the method of serial manipulations and cast which was based on the technique used by dr ponsetti for the treatment of ctev uh it was followed by minimal surgical resection after the plast uh, after the plaster applications so traditionally we used to manipulate uh, and uh, apply cast and then after that we used to do extensive soft tissue release and uh, it led to complete it led to many complications like a uh, stiffness of foot Taylor necrosis, uh, and many more complications. But this new method, uh, uh, used Ponsetti technique for the plaster application in the in a reverse manner as we do in the CTV. And after that, pinning of telonavicular joint is done, and then tenotomy of Achilles tendon is done. this is a level 4 type of study that is retrospective case series a uh, inclusion criteria which were taken in this study were persistent dorsal translation of forefoot on hind foot and there was fixed equinus contracture on the uh, on the when we uh, get the dorsiflexion view that uh, reflects uh, the per, uh, that reflects persistently tibio calcaneal angle reduced and in the exclusion criteria all the cases which were associated with the neuromuscular neuromuscular disorders were excluded so firstly um, uh, we get done uh, they get done the clinical examination then uh, they uh, got the ap and lateral radiographs and then uh, they applied the plasters with the ponsetti technique uh, and they corrected uh, all the deformities except the equinus after reduction of the telonavicular joint uh, they fix it with the k wire in a retrograde manner and then after that percutaneous tenotomy of the achilles tendon was done to correct the equinus deformity firstly um, as i told uh, they uh, apply the cast in the by applying a pressure on the plantar surface of the uh, talus and uh, as we do in the reverse manner and then uh, it led to maximum it it led to, it led to a uh, varus and uh, abduction of the fore uh, abduction of the forefoot and after that telonavicular joint It was fixed with K wire, and then it was, uh, and then actually tendon tenotomy was done. So, what were the results? A mean of five casts were required. All patients required actually tendon lengthening to correct the equinus deformity. Three patients had a recurrent deformity. None of them had K wire fixation of the telonavicular joint. at the time of the achilles tenotomy all patients were satisfied with the appearance of the foot mean ankle dorsiflexion which was achieved was 25 degree and plantar flexion was 33 degree significant improvement was seen in the taylor axis first metatarsal angle and talocalcaneal angle this was the appearance of hind foot after 3 years 
and a uh, 25 degree of dorsiflexion was achieved this was the um, uh, x ray uh, which was which was taken after 5 years uh, we can see here normal relationship of talus uh, calcaneal and uh, tibia and uh, tibia and calcaneum and uh, talus and first metatarsal limitations of this study were lack of prospective designs as it was a retrospective study there was a brief study duration uh, that is two year follow up it was small sample uh, small sample was taken and long term impact of treatment was unknown uh, as it has many uh, it has no complication i would like to choose this uh, method to treat congenital vertical talus uh, in my patients thank you very nicely presented uh, paper shinam very good now whenever you read a paper i want you guys to be to be a lawyer okay rather than relative of the authors so you have to be critical you have to learn how to read between lines this is an opportunity to dig into the limitations of paper you know the limitations which author mentions in the last para of discussion is not the real limitation the real limitations comes into the result section anyways but overall it was nicely read paper so uh, ashish would you like to comment uh, on this paper and then i'll share my thoughts on it yeah so nicely put uh, paper couple of things this paper really changed the practice it was one of those papers which changed thinking and changed the practice few things i have still not understood and i do differently is they talk about doing the ta tenotomy last i always think that it's the equinus which keeps the taylor plantar flex so i do tenotomy first which helps me to uh, dorsally or get the talus to neutral position and helps me to reduce that joint and hold it with the pin rather than doing at the end because i feel that if the ta is tight and you are putting a pin from navicular to talus and trying to bring it into dorsiflexion that is difficult if i do tenotomy first that's very easy and then of course the technical difficulties these uh, the the age group in this paper they are very young kids so all cartilaginous bones so sometimes it's really difficult to identify and get that wire in the first pass so that's another challenge with this so that's that's right ashish um, nicely said no i uh, did my first reverse ponsetti in year 2007 after reading this paper and uh, the navicular is not ossified so you have to take in consideration the talus talo first metatarsal axis that's the first yes. thing secondly uh, we do not know what is the end point of your plaster you know when you would do tenotomy and uh, uh, this uh, the, the wire fixation because every time you try to recreate a club foot type of situation by moving the four foot in uh, varus so considering when is the end point was a problem then there are some patients uh, where uh, the severity of the vertical talus is different so i would think that uh, this child can be now i can do tenotomy in wiring and the second time or uh, after two casts on the other side so convincing families of this two months old to undergo anesthesia for this procedure or to put a wire is very uh, disturbing to families that oh uh, you will put a wire in my child's foot so many a times you know, the family they run away uh, they, they they say you whatever you do you want to do plaster but we won't allow you to put a wire across so that we have to explain to them now the putting a transfixing wire was a real problem because in all open procedures we put a wire retrogradely from the head of talus it would come out posteriorly and then we reduce it 
and you you bring it now here you are reducing telonavicular joint where you cannot see the navicular and then you are aiming uh, taking the first metatarsal teller axis so putting that wire uh, uh, is a problem sometimes you think you have fixed it but it is passing way medial and so that would need multiple attempts so those were the difficulties of this paper now when i went to sick kids in 2008 they also this paper was very popular because it was a new thinking and uh, jose morquendo was also part of it who was a uh, who took over the practice of dr ponsetti so this paper was very popular in north america and at sick kids they already started doing this and in some of those patients at one year follow up dr jim wright found that some of them were re dislocated and they thought that they could not do this wiring properly and once they take took off the brace they undergo a repeat dislocation so jim wright came up with a mini open reduction so once you do casting you do open and you visualize the telonavicular reduction under a direct lesion and you can put wire from there so that paper has also been published and in later uh, papers of matt dobbs uh, he is mentioning that medial open reduction of tel telonavicular joint should be done it should not be completely blind so there is a history out after this and so the practice has changed significantly as ashish mentioned for younger children we can do uh, without major opening uh, by just mini open reduction uh from the medial side and visualizing telonavicular joint uh, right in front of you that's a key so yeah that was a nice paper let's uh, move on to the fourth paper from chinmay now that is a lovely paper which compares what happens when we apply this mini open technique to uh non idiopathic ones and what are the outcome difference yes chinmay uh just a moment that that was a question from chinma himself uh, ashish what is your bracing protocol after correction for these young ones usually i put them in a afo i tend to give cast for longer time usually i go about 8 weeks okay. and then put them in a brace for at least year and half right so, so i what have, do you do uh yeah what i do is um i also give afo for one year uh, uh, with an inversion mold a little bit i inquired with matt dobbs that uh, how would you splint them and he applies this uh, foot abduction orthosis you know which we apply for club foot but in neutral position and i said why you don't apply it, uh, separate uh, separate afo but they do this somehow uh, just uh, the john mitchell splint So I I did not understand why in club foot yes we know we have to maintain the rotation, but in vertical tailors we need some inversion and bit of uh, dorsiflexion. So I also give a unilateral AFO with mold and that is continued for one year. And after one year, if everything is fine, uh, then we discontinue for the idiopathic ones. For uh, the neuromuscular, I prefer to. Use it for till three four years because they have higher chances of recurrence. Bigneshwaran is asking, do we need to give medial arch mold in AFO? I I like to put that arch and keep to uh, keep the lateral structures bit stretched so that uh, the ortho test take this mold in that way about five to ten degree uh, inversion supination. and ankle in 5 degrees of dorsiflexion or neutral dorsiflexion i this is what i do i don't know whether uh, the main thing is a proper correction of telonavicular joint okay chinmay please go ahead with your paper chinmay uh, you are mute so can you unmute yourself Yes, sir. Now I'm audible, sir. Yes, yes. Please. Yes. Good morning, all. Myself, Doctor Chinmay. Uh, I'm presenting a paper from JPO, April 2021. Uh, the paper was uh, study was conducted in Sheffield University Medical School, United Kingdom. 
the title of the paper is the outcome of minimally invasive approach for congenital vertical talus with comparison between the idiopathic and syndromic foot so this is a level 4 case series so speaking about the background of this paper on which the paper is conducted that uh, previously uh, for any vertical talus there is a surgical treatment in the form of as previously mentioned in the paper is uh, uh, corrective casting and extensive surgical extensive open surgical technique but these are associated with a high complication rate in the form of recurrence uh, over correction under correction and stiffness of the foot the recurrence is the most common cause to overcome this uh, to overcome this all the complication dobbs in 2007 or uh, 6 and 7 give the uh, uh, idealistic paper of minim minimally invasive approach taking consider consideration in uh, this paper the current study was conducted so uh, in a methods it is a retrospective method to define the congenital vertical talus they follow the himanshi criteria that is uh, uh, that is the lateral talus axis first metatarsal angle base which is greater than 30 degree they define it is as a uh, vertical talus so after excluding after excluding the five patient in which they didn't have any clinical data and one patient death uh, due to the uh, unknown reason there are 21 patients in 30 feet so uh, out of 35th uh, 13 were idiopathic and 17 were syndromic in the in their treatment protocol they do a methylene manipulation by the uh, dobbs method after that they do a talonavicular reduction with a uh, kvar fixation and uh, percutaneous t8 anatomy they immobilize uh, immobilize and uh, uh, immobilize the foot ankle in dorsiflexion in neutral rotation and give a boot and bar in neutral rotation and 10 degree dorsal flexion the functional outcome was assessed by the roy functional questionnaire the roy functional questionnaire was specifically mentioned about the um, club foot and it is it can be also used for the foot deformities so these are the clinical these are the clinical aspect which was excellently uh, explained by the shinam and these are the clinical photos which was uh, published in the paper uh, showing the talonavicular reduction and subsequent follow up of the same child in the results 21 patients in the 30 feet uh, nine were bi bilateral and 12 were unilateral 13 idiopathic and 17 syndromic age at uh, age at the treatment uh, age at the treatment was average is 6 months the uh, average follow up was 77 months that is 6.5 years a number of preoperative cast was 5 close reduction was attempted in 29 patient and open reduction in one syndromic fit so uh, in, in a mean radiological parameters all the correction were uh, all the correction were uh, very uh, very well achieved Uh, with a uh, with a latest follow up of uh, ap talo calcaneal angle of 28 degrees ap uh, talo axis metatarsal base angle is of 23 degree lateral talo calcaneal 33 degree and a lateral talo axis first metatarsal base angle is 15 degree but the recurrence will occur in a five feet in three patients all recurrence in a first post operative period three by the close means and a two by the open reduction recurrence again uh, again explained by the uh, talo axis Uh, first metatarsal base angle greater than 30 degree and all the recurrence are uh, common in a syndromic foot in a mean radiological measurement uh, mean radiological measurement pre operatively early post operatively and a latest follow up or fit with a recurrence following the long term we can clearly see there is a, a early post operative period there is a ap and a lateral angle are well uh, well maintained in the normal value but as the patient they follow the patient over a longer period of time again there is a loss of reduction in all the syndromic feet uh, the second recur uh, the second recurrence occurs in all the feet there is a statistical correlation analysis between the recurrence and the syndromic foot the functional outcome they only conducted uh, functional outcome in 14 uh, patients average score for idiopathic is 11 and syndromic is 22 range of motion is 20 degree plantar flexion and 10 degree dorsiflexion in a discussion they uh, mentioned this all this four paper uh, starting from the dobbs which uh, carried the nine idiopathic which was uh, ex uh, explained by the shinam in his uh, in her presentation then again there is a paper by aslani in 2012 uh, but they didn't mention about the recurrence the chalon in jb just 2012 they uh, mentioned the recurrence in 20% in all syndromic fit the right in a uh, right uh, in a 21 patient 19 uh, 12 idiopathic and nine syndromic they mentioned the highest 47% recurrence and chan in uh, 2016 um, uh, mentioned about that uh, 25% in idiopathic and 40% in syndromic in a current study there is a 20, uh, 29% recurrence in only syndromic not in idiopathic in uh, speaking about the range of motion uh, so only yang et al uh, showed the minimal invasive have the excellent uh, result uh, in the form of uh, getting uh, good range of motion in a present study there is a 30 degree range of motion no difference in syndromic and idiopathic 
in a conclusion minimal invasive is a good outcome adhering to the treatment protocol is necessary idiopathic having a low recurrence rate speaking about the limitation they didn't mention about the coleman types that because the coleman types are important to describe about the calcopepinate subluxation because this subluxation will give it, give us the idea that this food will need uh, will uh, further go into the recurrence or it will need uh, any open reduction technique uh similarly uh, they didn't mention uh, that uh, recurrence uh, in a recurrence they didn't change or they didn't mention that the recurrence uh, the manipulation technique in 2012 again dof published the paper in which the, he showed uh, uh, the uh, we give the dorsal pressure over the talus similarly we have to give pressure in a lateral direction to uh, to increase the uh, talocalcaneal angle in a ap view and similarly the bracing protocol uh, in a bracing and exercise protocol uh, they didn't mention about any uh, angles uh, for the uh, bracings uh, the in a uh, dof jb just 2016 they mentioned about the 15 degrees plantar flexion solid afo and in exercise and uh, ankle plantar flexion and eversion exercises implication in our practice uh, minimal invasive are good for the idiopathic one year strict photo uh, uh, strict follow up is needed to achieve for the any recurrences and role in a syndromic fit is a still a questionable to go for a minimal invasive surgery thank you yes it's nicely read paper uh, chinmay thank you sir so the question my question is how many pops they required before performing this wiring in idiopathics and how many neuromuscular syndromic mm -hmm. now that range okay. was from 2 to 12 plasters so yes sir. is there any uh, they didn't mean uh, describe uh, uh, separately sir they only mentioned the average age uh, average for five class only the range is bit too long so one child required 12 plasters mm -hmm. so i assume that's for yeah ashish your take on this paper how would you read it uh, uh nicely done study um i am little unsure about the criteria the tamba and the confusion between oblique talus and vertical mm. talus mm -hmm. i see it more of a clinical diagnosis vertical talus rather than a radiological diagnosis mm -hmm. what what's your take on this molin yeah so because it gets into little gray area oblique talus when to call it when to treat it that's very unclear the key thing is to me also is a hind foot uh, tightness you know so whether this you do stress x rays and uh, on stress x rays uh, besides this uh, talocalcaneal angle you know tbo calcaneal angle is important if the the there is the cal that's what's known as fixed calcaneum so on lateral dorsiflexion and plantar flexion stress views if the calcaneum does not move much and we know that we have to invert the foot to lock the joint and invert and dorsiflex and plantar flex so if there is a fixed calcaneum then even this tamba is less it falls into category of oblique talus you have to do intervention you know just like deal it with like a vertical talus only because it leads to gradually increasing deformity and that oblique talus would end up end up into a kind of uh, vertical talus so that's my uh, my take on that we know that uh, this uh, the syndromic club feet they are sometimes they are not amenable for uh, correction by just plasters you know you they are so rigid by doing multiple plaster you don't find them moving so what i do is if i do one or uh, i mean uh, two or three plasters and it's not buzzing then with the minimal correction we give a small thermoplastic splint and then we tell parents that we would do a uh, definite surgery around one year so when i start treatment for idiopathic ones um, then we are pretty confident that this will get gradually corrected but when it comes into syndromic uh, at the outset i tell the family that only 50% we can achieve correction through this method and we'll do a few casting and see if it is coming up then we'll proceed further and not then we'll just put the child in a thermoplastic splint you just stretch the skin by doing regular therapy and we'll do definite surgery at one year that's how i did now sudhir is asking 
Equinus is the main difference between ob oblique and vertical talus. So now, you know, when there is, I, I feel that oblique talus patients would need intervention only if there is heel cord tightness. If heel cord is stretchable, then this oblique talus will behave like a simple flexible flat feet, you know. With uh, when child is non weight bearing, there will be mild flattening of arch, and that might not have many um, uh, long term. The long term issues would happen only when the equinus is uh, there. That's my uh, thinking about it. So I remember one child in uh, in sick case, Dr. Andrew Howard. Uh, he operated upon an oblique talus. So from the criteria of this four foot, it was an oblique talus. So everyone asked, why did you operate on an oblique talus? But he said there was significant equinus. And so even though the four foot criteria are not, the angles are not coming in that term of vertical talus or in oblique, I, I would like to operate. And I agreed with him at that point. How to decide which foot to cast and which not, as x-ray look quite similar in uh, severe plano valgoid feet. So that's a very nice question, Gaurav. So I, uh, at times we are not able to uh, find out and but you once you do a couple of casting, you know, you will see the foot is correcting. So those foot which keeps on correcting, there you continue plaster and uh, otherwise this is same like uh, some congenital knee dislocations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, arthrogapotic with knee dislocation, you do couple of plaster and you will see whether it is moving or not. If it is not moving, then splint them and do definite uh, open surgery. Uh, Ashish, uh, do you think the same way or how? what is the end point of casting in uh, syndromic club foot in your practice? So syndromic club foot, uh, I start all uh, tailors, vertical tailors with casting and if I'm getting some correction, I continue. But if they are syndromic and uh, I'm not getting sufficient correction. If I'm not getting uh, that uh, uh, convexity getting reduced, then I, I stop at that point and suggest we do something at later stage when we know how the child is likely to walk and what is the prognosis like. I tend not to operate on syndromic vertical tailors at two or three months of age. I, I give a little bit more time. Give, give that they see some of these syndromic children also have systemic affection and they might have a congenital cardiac or renal anomalies. So by the time of one year, you know, there's all these congenital anomalies get exposed. Yeah. And so that when you operate, uh, you know that there is only problem in feet and nowhere else. And in the meanwhile, you ask family to do passive stretching so that uh, their skin get with stretched and you may not uh, have developed skin problems later on. So, I mean, that brings us to the question that how do we know if we are seeing a newborn baby with vertical tailors that this is idiopathic? What kind of test we do? That we may yeah. not know immediately, right? Yeah, the, see, the, and there are some genetic ones where they, they have spontaneous mutations which you will not find Absolutely. So you, I don't, uh, unless it is a, I do a sacral ultrasound to find out whether there is tethered cord or any dysraphism, but I don't go for genetic testing because anyways, we, we have to operate upon them if they don't burst to plaster. And sometimes the genetic testing comes negative. There is no specific genes associated with vertical tails. You know? Absolutely. So I agree. It is important to tell families that vertical talus is associated with congenital anomalies or syndromes and there is a possibility that down the line we may find something which is not manifesting right now and for younger children few months old you know the our neurologists they are not very comfortable doing emg and cv either because the size is so small so they don't know from where the currents are coming and you know that's so that's why I just do sacral ultrasound and make sure there is no tethered cord. You know, that's it. If it is normal, then I will go on. What is your protocol? Older children with neglected CVT. 
So I I mentioned that we do uh, three incision technique. Uh, older means uh, if child is less than five, six years, then uh, uh, three incision techniques of tissue release, open reduction. More than five, six years, and even after doing all soft tissue release, you are not able to reduce talus and navicular. Then I would excise the, the cartilage of talus and navicular and do talonavicular fusion. And in most severe cases, uh, 10 years, 11 years, we, they require fusion surgeries. Sometimes they need triple fusion in a very severe case, you know. Okay, so let me... Uh, one sir, I question. have one question. Yeah, yeah, please. Me yes, meanwhile, I'll share my screen. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, when we correcting this uh, foot by the casting, once we getting the uh, arch back, can we stop on that moment that it is getting reduced? Then we uh, do percutaneous stenotomy and KY. Are we, uh, it's a it's a springy, you know, like uh, you clinically. Mm -hmm. In manipulation, you think that now arch is recreated, but you, when you leave, it comes back. So, mm -hmm. so it's you try to invert and it, just like uh, you supinate, so like club foot, and then you have to check under image intensifier that whether the teller head is aligned with the first metatarsal or not. And if it is there, then you can uh, do first stenotomy, as Ashish said, and then put a wire. And then you re you rely on this, but now it is wise to do a medial open reduction. You know, um, what I tend to do is uh, I check in X-ray when I am using uh, this percutaneous method and see where this stellar uh, head axis lies in in front of uh, this first metatarsal or not, mm -hmm. and then we go for surgery. How often we need radiograph post-operatively, how long we should follow this children look for recurrence. Uh, I, I would say that uh, if an idiopathic one, one year follow-up is okay. Recurrence are more evident clinically than radiologically. Uh, the forefoot would go in abduction, hind foot will go in bit of uh, valgus. So that will be more evident. And for uh, neurologic, they can recur. So you splint them for long. It's not only x-ray which will tell you it is recurred, but also clinically you will see. When uh, you would do a re-surgery, Ashish? Surgery. So I tend to do re-surgery when they are little older, at least more than one and a half year old, so that I can get that wire in reasonably good right. bone. So, the after doing this mini open uh, in syndromic ones, if you find that there is a relapse, then uh, uh, the giant has worked in Alder Hay and he tend to say that we should do uh, this thing. Uh, uh, the tibialis anterior is transferred to the teller head. You know, and in very severe cases, one can do the uh, telonavicular fusion. Let me stop share and then reshare. Okay. okay, so should I move on to the last paper quickly? Yes. Resume slideshow. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, sir. Okay, let me quickly take you through this. Uh, I'm not able to move. Let me stop sharing. Now, Again, share screen, PowerPoint. Ah, okay. So now this paper is published in JPOB 2020, comparison of outcomes between idiopathic and non-idiopathic vertical talus deteriorated soft tissue release. So Chinmay's paper was on um, uh, minimally invasive approach and this is for open approach. 
This paper is from Manipal. Dr. Hitesh Shah is a main author. And uh, the aim was to compare the outcome uh, uh, in open surgeries by two incision approach, the dorsal, which has been described by Simon, and the posterior approach. So what they have done, uh, they tend to treat this uh, vertical talus patients irrespective of the type uh, with the casting in the first year. And then if uh, they don't uh, correct, then they would do the surgery. And there are some patients who are present for the first time after uh, two years. So the minimum age was two years. 33 feet, 15 were idiopathic and 18 were syndromic. Uh, they had minimum two years follow-up, mean follow-up was five and a half years, and they have checked clinical radiologic and functional outcome comparison. They found that the idiopathic had better range of motion at the final follow-up. Functional outcomes were also better, but overall clinical and radiological functional outcomes are good in both the groups. So even syndromic patients, when they have done surgery at two years by double incision technique, that is dorsal, followed by a posterior, they have done tenotomy in uh, uh, idiopathic cases and in cases where they are very severe, they have done capsulotomy. Through dorsal approach, as uh, Gaurav already mentioned, they've done a release of everything. Uh, they have not touched the plantar capsule of telonavicular joint, neither they have plicated tip post. They have lengthened T band, EHL, EDL, and peroni, and uh, the dorsal, uh, lateral, and medial capsule of calcaneonavicular joint, calcaneocuboid joint. So they concluded that two incision soft tissue release induces good outcome for all the patients, while range of motion was more in idiopathic. The overall outcome was good which is expected. Now, what are the limitations? You know, uh, they, uh, they mentioned the lengthening of T-band. They have not mentioned what sort of, they do Z lengthening or they just do tenotomy. Uh, so that I, I, I'm going to write to Hitesh that what they do. They have not mentioned uh, about any skin complications. So uh, I'm also a bit concerned because the skin healing was concerned in previous papers of dorsal incision, but they have not uh, done much uh, about this. They have not written specifically, so that I need to inquire. Now, when you use one technique for neuromuscular or syndromic and one for idiopathic, the outcomes are very much expected. The outcome would be always better in idiopathic ones. So, and there is no uh, comparison with other soft tissue release method, like a triple incision method or a posterior only method. So it's just one approach to this problem and they, they have found good result. They have compared, although with a historic group, I would say it was a favorable, whenever you are comparing your study with uh, the historic group, you would choose the most, uh, the group where there were more complications so that you can show that your technique is better in terms of lesser complication rate. So, but I feel that this paper is good because we, we saw already in Chinmay's paper that uh, for syndromic club foot, the minimal invasive or DOPS technique yields a higher rate of complication, relapses, recurrences. But at around the age of two years, if you do this two stage, uh, two uh, incision technique, the results are fairly okay. They have uh, out of 18, five patients had recurrence of four foot, uh, they got in four foot abduction and hind foot valgus, but they could manage them with splints. So this was the outcome. What is application in practice? I have been doing this three uh, incision techniques like a medial, lateral, and posterior. Uh, through the lateral incision, I can lengthen the uh, EDLs, uh, peroni, and the calcaneocuboid capsule. Uh, from the medial approach, I can uh, very easily see the P-band and the EHL. So, uh, but I would like to see how the whole dorsal approach, uh, how easy it is to perform. The the thing is, uh, 
I want to be sure that there is no skin complications. When you do three incision technique, you are far away from the dorsalis pedis vessel. So you, you are not worried about vessels where they are far away. Uh, so, but I would like to try this approach in my next case and, and, and see how, uh, how it is different. Because I see a lot of edema in uh, first post-operative week when I use triple approach. Maybe the, there is no mention about what is a post-operative edema and how it resolves in this paper, but I will inquire personally to the main author. So thank you very much. Any question on this? Ashish, yeah. what, what do you think no, about that's this That's a very nicely done paper. I use the same, but uh, last few years I have been doing percutaneous tendoculis stenotomy just based on experience of club foot even up to children up to age four years i do percutaneous or make a small incision deliver a tendon and do tenotomy and i think that that is working well yeah any any question or comments okay so if there is nothing, uh, yes, Chinway, is every paper today, no one is having ideal bracing protocol, so what we should follow. So let me summarize this topic uh, in few points. The first is the main etiology is unknown. In neuromuscular cases, we think that there is imbalance between inverters and inverters. The radiological diagnosis should be based on lateral views as well as AP views. In lateral view, you must do a stress dorsiflexion and plantar flexion x-ray to see whether calcaneum is fixed or not. In other words, whether it is an equinus or not. When you do stress x-ray, invert the foot because once you invert, it will not give you a correct estimation of equinus. For younger children, with normal sacral ultrasound or normal uh, no signs of other syndromic affection, one should consider it as an idiopathic uh, CVT where you can try reverse Ponseti technique. You need to apply four or five plasters and creating a club foot deformity. And then you can do a uh, uh, mini open talonavicular uh, reduction under vision and put a K wire across after doing PA tenotomy. If your reverse ponsetti is not buzzing, then put child in a thermoplastic splint and come back at one year, and you can perform either a two stage, uh, a two incision or a three incision technique and do perform the open reduction. Uh, the splinting protocols uh, for all idiopathic vertical tailors, one year separate uh, uh, AFOs are fine for. Neuromuscular, a longer duration of uh, orthosis is um, expected. There are higher rates of recurrence in syndromic club feet. There is better range of motion in idiopathic club feet. If you come across a neglected vertical talus after three, four years, and you are not able to align a telonavicular joint, even after doing uh, the all releases, you might have to do telonavicular fusion in that case. And then there are some uh, neglected myelomeningocele patients where patients come in adolescence. There you have to go for triple fusion surgeries. Gaurav is asking how long to keep cast post-surgery. Uh, my take is six weeks. At 15 days, we take the sutures off and apply a plaster for one more month. Ashish uh, is doing for two months. In this Hitatius uh, paper, they also mentioned for six weeks. And another question from uh, Vivek, uh, do you do tenotomy of EDL, EHL or Z-plasty? Uh, for syndromic, you know, they are so tight, I have at times done tenotomies. For idiopathics, I have never required it. Uh, T-band lengthening, if it is required, I do infraretinacular Z-lengthening. There are papers which uh, explain supraretinacular lengthenings also, but sometimes the supraretinacular lengthenings are not very effective. Any role of navicular excision? Yes, there, there is a paper on navicular excision for vertical tailors. So that was that has been used in very severe cases. 
okay uh, thank you everyone for your interaction and i hope uh, this journal club will help you in your practice thanks ashish for your time thank you thank you thank you thanks sir. everyone thank you molin okay. take care everyone we'll meet on saturday with um, uh, for the the fellow stitching module and uh, with dr ramani thanks gaurav so i'm